I wanted to walk you guys through our property and how we have been bringing in more and more food in order to feed our family of four. So if you watched any of my previous uh, garden tours and or fruit planting videos, then you saw where we put in a bunch of new fruit trees last year. Some of them are having a few issues though, so I wanna walk you through and show you what we're doing and just what to expect if you see this on your own fruit trees. So one, new growth, which you're gonna have a lot of on new fruit trees. Well, hopefully, if you planted them right, if you watched my video, then you know the steps to take. But deer really like the new tender growth that happens on fruit trees. And unfortunately, they will come in and they can completely strip a small tree of all of its leaves. And as we know, a tree needs leaves in order to feed itself through the cycle, especially in the summertime. So we were out, we had the trees. I had taken their netting off as we were doing amendments and working on them. And my husband got up for work one morning, which he gets up really early. And I heard him banging on the window and I honestly thought like he had locked himself out of the house and needed to come back in for something. And then I opened my eyes and I realized he's banging on the bedroom window, but from the inside looking out and there were six deer who were having a lovely buffet of all of our fruit trees. So needless to say that night when he got home from work, we came out here and put in um, all of the T posts and got all of the trees netted to keep the deer out. We have tried all the different methods to keep deer out of fruit trees. And honestly, the barrier method is the one that works the most consistent for us. So that's what we've done. Now, this is a peach tree that we put in last year. And it was, oh, I think it was about two years old when we actually got it from the nursery. So it's going on its third year here. But the reason I wanted to show it to you is because I have some little baby peaches. And I'm super excited because I've never had peaches before <sighs> from our own tree, I should say. So there are some little baby ones growing in here. Aren't they just cute as a button? So I did go through and thin them, however, because this is still a fairly young tree and I don't want to stress it out too much, but I just could not bear to thin out all the fruit. And knowing that it's at least three years old, we're going to let some of them develop. But I did thin it so it's not too many. But one of the things that I noticed, and this is very common where we live, and you may be seeing it right now, is we have a little bit of peach leaf curl disease that's happening. So this is, see that? You can see that on, on the leaves here. It's not really bad. It can get bad, um, but the time to treat it is actually in the fall and then in the winter time. Um, it's something that's just in the air. It's all over, especially in wet parts of the country like the Pacific Northwest. And so we have to treat it with, um, it's copper is an organic method that works really well as a fungicide. Um, but when all the, the leaves drop off in the fall, you want to spray the tree down and then again right before the leaf buds begin to leaf out so that if there is any of the fungus fungicide or excuse me if there is any of the fungus present then the fungicide will have a chance to kill it so there's absolutely no point in spraying this tree at this point it has to be done in the fall and then right before leaf bud again in the spring to help it and most of the time you'll always have where we live, we just kind of know you're always going to have a little bit of it, uh, but you don't want to get it too bad. A small amount like this isn't going to harm the tree at all, but if it were to completely take over it, um, then you could start to have some potential issues. So just something to keep an eye on if you see that on some of your leaves on your peach tree. Uh, that's what that is and that's how you combat that. So we've got these all, all netted, which has kept the deer out, even though they technically could reach up here. This seems to be enough that they have not came back me screeching at them opening the front door and yelling and screeching at them may have had something to do with that i'm not sure because they did take off and run <laughs> um and we didn't we didn't net the crab apple uh, mainly because i have enough it's a bigger tree and i've got enough up top that i'm not too worried about that one but we did go through um, and net all of the rest of these in order to keep them off so this one um, they did kind of come in and they got a little bit on it like you can see here they've came in they were just starting on it, but not too much damage was done. So the fruit tree guild, uh, or part of our food forest, if you saw that video, here's the lupin. And you can really see this is all, a lot of it has blossomed out. I've got lots of little seed pods that are happening, which I'm very excited about, because that means that we'll reseed in this area and we'll get even more. Um, and I, the seed pods apparently are edible. I've not tried eating one of them yet. I was gonna research that one a little bit more. Um, 
but a lot of you were telling me that the pods are edible. So I haven't tried those yet, but I've got a lot. I kind of wanted to let the majority of them reseed um, because once these dry out, I don't have any, mm, those ones aren't quite, aren't quite there yet. Once they get really dried out and that means the seed is fully uh, developed inside the pod, I'm gonna take them and spread the seed around the bottom of the other fruit trees so I can get all of them seeded with it. Um, so I haven't tried testing any of these yet. But you can catch that video and learn about all the other plants and why we're doing this under here if you want to. And then this is my Gravenstein apple tree, which I don't have um, as many apples on this one. That This one doesn't really need thinning. However, this apple tree is always really, really productive for me. But you do want to thin the apple. So if you've ever had, I'm like hiding, hello there. <laughs> if you um, have noticed with your apple trees, one year you'll have super heavy production. Like you got a ton of harvest. And then the next year you have har don't have hardly any. Not always, but a lot of, oftentimes that is a sign that the fruit wasn't thinned. And so the tree really used all of its energy and resources and it doesn't have enough left to produce a lot the following year. Now, weather can come in, there's always, you know, there's always exceptions to that rule. So if you had a late frost or different things like that, that could affect it too. But a lot of times that's what happens. So when you've got these blossoms here, which I saved this branch, I've went through and thinned out quite a bit of these already. Um, but as these develop, these apples get really big. There's no way that I can have all of these apples developing right here on this branch, this close together. So you wanna go through and when you have a cluster like this, I always leave the largest, best looking apple, which is usually the apple that's in the center. Not always, but usually. And so you just wanna go ahead and try to pull off these guys here. And we're just gonna leave the center one. Now, I'm gonna do the same thing right here. And these are a little bit close together but I'm just gonna let them continue to develop. And then over on this side, this is really close. Like a lot of these are close. So you could pull these off um, and leave them. I have a hard time doing that though. So I'm gonna thin it right now to just those. Now you can do whatever you want with these. Um, at one time I was gonna be really industrious and I was gonna save these and I was gonna cook them down and I was gonna make like strain them so that I had an extra pectin source. But I have enough other apples when they're larger to do that with my pectin source. And so I have to be honest, um, I did not go through the work of doing that. But you could definitely put these in your compost pile. I don't know if the chickens would eat these or not. They're pretty tart and small. It's worth a shot though. And I often get asked why which I need to take that one down because it's actually from last year and get my new ones up, but why we have these little red looking trap things. It's an apple maggot trap. So you coat it with this sticky residue substance and you hang them in your tree. And right now is the prime time to get them up in June before the baby immature apples fully begin to develop. And then the apple maggot fly will be attracted to that and it lands on it. And as you can see, there's a ton of bugs stuck on there because it's sticky. Um, then it can't fly and actually lay its eggs in my developing apples. I've tried a lot of different methods. I know some of you guys were asking me, you'd saw on the apple trees last year in some of the videos where I had like little, they kind of look like nylons, like you know those little footy nylons they give you at shoe stores or they used to back in the day to try shoes on. Um, and I, so I tried that on some of the apples, but I was not impressed. It was super time consuming. And I felt that those apples that I had the nylons over, they actually had way more earwigs in them than the apples that didn't have any covering. And so I just, I wasn't a big fan. I felt that these traps were a lot more effective um, than trying to bag every single apple. So I need to get new ones up though, because the sticky residue on those is pretty much gone because I didn't get it down from last year. So this year we've got some crop rotation going on. Last year we put this garden bed in new and we had corn in here, which was in this section. And so following crop rotation, if you have my book, The Family Garden Plan, then you've got all the crop rotation information in there. Um, but I like to follow corn with a fruiting crop. And so we've got all of the winter and uh, zucchini squash are in this area and these beds. And then I have got my potatoes 
over here, which aren't quite ready. Actually, I take that back. Some of those are ready to be held, but I'll probably wait a couple of more days till all of them are a little bit taller, some of the, the smaller ones. Um, and we'll go ahead and do the first tilling on those. And then um, behind them, we have got, I'm loving this trellis system. This is the second, is it the second or third year? of using the hog panel trellis system. And I just completely adore it. In fact, we put another one in this year. Um, but I have got my Tar Heel pole beans are on this side, which they're all just starting to sprout up here. Everything's just starting to grow. Um, and then I've got onions are in the center. Now, as far as companion planting goes, alum family, so onions, garlic, etc., and beans aren't considered friendly to one another. But in the past, I have had onions near my green beans and I have never had any type of production issues. I didn't notice any difference. And really with companion planting, for there to be a big difference, I've got almost two feet between them. It's not like they're planted interspersed between the rows or super close together. So I'm really not worried about this row of beans being this close to the onions because in the past, I have not noticed any difference whatsoever. But then on this side, we have got pickling cucumbers um, all along here, which are just, they're just starting to sprout. I just, we just planted these last week. Um, things, right, it's actually, we're having like this weird heat wave that it's supposed to be, you guys are gonna laugh at me. Those of you who live in the South, you have just, you're gonna just die laughing, but we're in the mid eighties and I'm dying. I'm dying, you guys, but to be fair, two days ago, it was only 56 degrees was our high. So we went from 56 degrees as the high to almost 90 degrees and I'm whining and melting a little bit. So anyways, that is why my garden isn't in a very um, advanced state right now on these warm weather crops because we literally just got warm enough to plant this stuff um, and put it in the ground direct so a couple weeks ago. Now I've got a little bit more of um, pickling cucumbers down here. So there's some baby ones that are just, like they have hardly broke the surface at all here coming up. But what I'm really excited about is down here, so on this, half of this one, I am growing melons for the very first time. Living this far uh, north where we're typically so cool, not a lot of people grow melons here. I, have, I think I know a couple of people who've tried watermelons and it, depending on the weather for the year, um, so, so success. But I found this melon from Siskiyou Seeds, which is a heirloom organic seed company out of Oregon. So they have very similar growing conditions to me. So if you can find a seed company that is growing their seed in a climate similar to yours, that's the ticket because it's already gonna be acclimated to your area. So it is a melon that is an heirloom melon. I don't know why I'm still carrying these apples around, probably because I was gonna take them to the chickens, but it's supposed to grow well in Northern shorter summers, cooler summers. So I'm super, super excited. Um, and I've got some of them that are just beginning to pop up um, on here. So I can't wait to see how those do. I'm very hopeful and quite excited. So that's a new one for me. And then I've got more onions um, in this bed. And these are actually daikon radish, which have bolted on me because we went from 56 degrees to almost 90 in three days time. So these guys have bolted um, which is okay. I have still pulled up and used some of the, the radishes when they've bolted, um, but they'll throw out these little seed pods. These are just beginning to develop, which is why these reseeded because they did the same thing to me last year. Um, I actually prefer growing daikon radish in the fall, not the spring, because they usually always bolt on me. However, as these seed pods develop, they are edible. Um, and then of course, I've got myself a new seed supply, so I don't ever have to buy the seeds again. So. I've got those guys here. And what's really funny is because they bolted last year and then we tilled this up again. And so that distributed them over here. So I actually have baby daikon radish that are popping up all throughout this area, but they're just going to go to bolt because we're just moving further into summer. So I can use them as a micro green, micro green or I can pull them up and feed them to the chickens. So they'll serve a purpose and feed something on the homestead one way or the other. So we've got the high tunnel over here and it's doing really well. The tomatoes and the peppers, I just actually watered them last night. And these guys, I started from seed indoors 
oh gosh, the time of filming, we're right at the beginning of June. And I started these in March. And I'm really excited. Now you can see if I were to try to direct sew because we're so late here, like my beans are literally this big. If I tried to only direct sow tomatoes and not start them in the house, there would be no way that I would ever get a harvest off of them before our first frost would come in. So these were started um, much, much earlier, but I've already got some blossoms. So I've got San Marzano Lungo in here as well as some Amish paste. So that's what these rows are through here. So I've already got blossom formation, very excited about that. I have a little bit of damage here um, that was touching the ground here um, before it started to grow up. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and prune that back. And I don't want that beginner sucker shoot there. I don't mind at the middle of the plant that some of the sucker shoots come out because those will produce more tomatoes. But I generally prune the sucker shoots off the very bottom and any of the leaves. I had some flea beetles actually that came in. So that, I don't know if you can see the damage on these leaves. But they only really attacked the bottom leaves, which I was going to prune off anyways. But there's a little bit of flea beetle damage. I usually only get it in the very early part of spring, um, or I should say early summer. We're at the end of spring here. Um, and then they leave the tomatoes alone. So I'm not too worried about it, but I might come out here and sprinkle with a little bit of DE or maybe a spray of neem oil. I didn't want to spray with the neem oil while it was this hot though, uh, because in the high tunnel it gets even hotter and I didn't want to burn the leaves. So we're supposed to cool back down and go back go back into the 50s again this weekend, crazy weather. Um, so I'll probably go ahead and come out and treat them if I still see some signs of flea beetles. Um, but they're doing really well. In fact, I think I have a baby green tomato on the brandy wine down there. This was, which if you watched that last video where I talked about how we have really decided to do a lot more food production on the farm, both for us and then also with hopes of moving into doing, uh, having stuff for sale from our homestead for our local community. This is just for us, however, right now, this phase. But this was just lawn and we decided we were gonna grow a lot more corn. In fact, we're really excited. My husband wants to grow and grind our own corn to make our own cornmeal, to do cornbread, etc. with. So this is all corn. So it's all different kinds of heirloom sweet corn that we've got here. And as I said, this was literally just lawn that we just tilled up and we left this, we even have a strip of the sod still in here between, which we'll just mow those down. Um, but the corn is all pretty much coming up, which I'm very excited about. And then the only row, which I ended up planting a couple of days later, and I'm the one that planted it, but my popcorn has not popped up yet. So all of the sweet corn is up. But my popcorn, which is this row, oh wait, did one pop up or is that grass? Ah, eh, it's grass, I got excited. So I need to look, I haven't ever grown popcorn before actually, we've done lots of sweet corn and different corn varieties, but I've never done popcorn. So I need to see if the germination time is just a little bit longer on the popcorn or I might have to replant, which is kind of funny because it's the only row that I planted. My husband did all the other rows and they came up just fine. So, you know team effort there. <laughs> I usually have to replant at least one thing twice, um, depending upon the year. So this year it may be the corn that I'm having to replant. But we've got um, the perennial part of the garden is going really well right now. The raspberries are just coming along phenomenally. I actually fertilized as one should in the fall with chicken manure this year. And so the raspberries were very, very happy. They were pretty yellow last year. They were kind of anemic looking and it was because I didn't, I skipped a year of fertilizing by accident. Um, so these guys are coming along really good. We're gonna have quite a few, these are my autumn bearings. So these will be producing fruit for us um, August, September into October. But these guys, I'll probably have raspberries here in about another mm, two to three weeks, depending upon the weather. So really excited to see this really filling in and getting thick and lush. And then the blueberries, you guys, I have a sad story. I have a very sad story. The large, tall, my biggest blueberry plant. It was over 10 years old and we had to pull it out, it died. Um, actually, technically I killed it, but the reason that that happened is because it got the mummy berry fungus. It, over 75% of the bush was covered in mummy berry fungus, including it had went beyond just the berries, then it had moved into the leaves. So at that point, I wasn't gonna get any fruit production on it anyways, it was majorly into decline. So we ended up pulling it out. But I've got a new blueberry plant and 
yes, it is planted in the same soil, which you may be wondering like, Melissa, why on earth would you plant a blueberry back in the same soil if it was that heavily infected? The reason for that is because the mummy berry is a two-part infection. So I just planted this as a bare root plant. I know right now it probably looks like it's dead, but it's not, I promise. I just got it in the ground three days ago. Um, but I removed all of, so when the mummy berry, which is the infected berry, um, and it will start to form, and then before it can have a chance to get ripe, it kind of like shrivels up and looks like a mauve weird color, and it just drops off. So those, Bo, go on. Thank you. No, no, no. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> so as the mummy berry falls off and hits the ground, then in the, when conditions are right, but usually in the win uh, winter, sometimes early spring, depending on how cold you are, um, it forms this little tiny mushroom. And so then those spores from that mushroom splash back up and they infect the plant. So if you, and it's almost impossible to one, get all of the berries that may have mummy berry before they fall. You're probably going to miss one. But two, there's also just spores that are out and about. Um, so you want to cover the surface of the soil with about three inches of mulch before that mummy berry mushroom is formed. So before that those spores can actually hit the air and infect anything. Well, I thought that we had been doing a good job of that, which none of my other plants, they're all the same age and none of them are infected. They're all doing really, really great, as you can see. There are varieties that are more susceptible to mummy berry and the variety that I had in here before obviously was one that was much more susceptible. So I did get a cultivator that is supposed to not be as susceptible to mummy berry. It's an Olympia blueberry. Um, I got this, I like to get my bare root plants. I've had really good success. I should say they always have a really large root system on them is from raintreenursery.com. That's who we got the fruit trees from too, the newer ones. Um, so this one's not supposed to be as susceptible. Um, and then I, it works with the other varieties that I already have as far as pollination. So what we, I think happened is we'd have, our winters are being kind of weird. Anybody else experienced that? Where like your weather is not how it used to be, especially if you've lived in the area for a long time. I sound ancient right now. Back when I was a kid, winters were much colder. They really were though. So <laughs> I think that I need to mulch earlier and I've been mulching too late and that some of the mushrooms have already formed and they're really small and so it's hard to see them. And so I think that we've had some mushrooms that were popping up before I could even see them and that's what was reinfecting the plant. So we're gonna try it again. And I removed back, I had like the mulch level, you can see like was this deep. Um, and that was like all around the drip line of the plant or where the berries would have fall. So I removed all of that. So if there were any fallen berries in there that had the mummy berry, they've all been removed out from this area. And then I will remulch and fertilize this fall, um, which should take care of any of that again. So anyhow, if you've had mummy berries, that's, that's my story on this one. And then my asparagus. Guys, look at how tall this asparagus is. Isn't it crazy? So this is a newer bed for us with asparagus. This thing is like taller than me. I'm five foot six in case you were wondering. So this is my really tall asparagus and we're letting it fern out to feed back to the crown so that we'll have a really good patch here for years and years to come. Um, so we'll be harvesting off of this next year. Um, we weren't harvesting off of it this year just to let everything go back and feed really well. But as you can tell, it's pretty happy. And then the grapes are coming on. I've got more raspberries here. I think we're gonna have a really good raspberry harvest this year. Um, the grapes are starting to come in. They'll continue to go up and fill over top of this um, as the summer goes on, which is great because it'll provide more shade. But look at all my little grape clusters. So there'll be lots and lots of grapes that are forming all along here. I, you know what's so funny? Like, I find it to be one of the most relaxing things is when everything's for me, like I just love to come and walk through the fruit trees and the fruit plants and like look and be like, oh, look at all the little baby fruit that we're gonna get to eat come soon. I don't know, maybe I'm the only gardener that likes to do that, I'm not sure, but it's one of my favorite things this time of year. But I'm really excited because this is my, oh, there's a rock. Second year, move bud. And my strawberries have been growing in the green stock container. So they're actually doing really well. They were a little droopy yesterday because we were so hot. So I gave them a ton of water last night. I'll water them again. These guys were really droopy. They pretty much came out of it, but let me fill the soil down here. Oh, it's not too bad. Um, I'll make sure that I water again really 
Well, that's the only thing I've noticed with the green stock is it's with any container, but when it's hot out, I have to really make sure that I stay on top of the watering um, with these guys, especially with strawberries, because if you don't stay on top of the watering, that's when you can get some like weird misshapen berries. And I like mine to be, you know, really lush and sweet. I was thinking, I saw that I had one strawberry that was just beginning to get close to ripe when I was out here yesterday. See, there it is. Yeah, not quite. Be a little bit longer, but I was getting pretty excited. So this is the first year I'm getting a full harvest off of these. Uh, last year was the first year that I had planted them. Actually, there's a leaf that needs to come off. Um, last year was the first year I'd planted them, and so I only allowed it the two berries per plant so that it would go back and feed the root, kind of the same principle like with the asparagus with any of your perennials. But this year, there was no pinching off of blossoms, and so I'm super excited because they're just all coming on, and strawberries are one of my absolute favorites, so can't wait for those. So this is kind of an area of the house that we never really did a whole lot. And then we just tossed out a whole bunch of packets of wildflower seeds. And so I've got like flowers galore that are coming up. And then I also had put the Egyptian walking onions out here, mainly because they're a perennial. And so I didn't want to put them in the regular annual vegetable garden because they would just spread everywhere. But these are one of my absolute favorite onions, mainly because I love perennials because I don't have to really do much with them and they just keep producing food for me all the time. So what's cool about these guys is you can see where they come up and on the head, they form like, you know, this little head, which actually is pretty. It almost looks like a flower, it's not. But these are little itty bitty tiny onion bulbs. And so as these develop, they will get heavier and then they will actually fall over <laughs> And that's why they call them walking because it's almost like they walk so it'll fall over and then all of these will become more onion plants so it's great because you've always got onions that are just repopulating themselves now i don't actually eat the bulbs because they're pretty small as you can see it's not like a you know regular large onion bulb but they're great like i've been you can see where i've been like coming out here and breaking stocks off I just use them as a green onion. And so I don't have to plant green onions. I can use them and chop them up really fine, just like you would a green onion um, and salads or just whatever. So I really like it. Plus I think they're cool to look at. Like they're kind of funky and fun. Like I feel like they fill in the landscape, but they are inedible and are really pretty. So I really like these um, Egyptian walking onions. I've had these in here for gosh, like three or four years. A member of the Pioneering Today Academy actually had them and said, I haven't seen these in, the, in your garden. Do you want me to send you some? And I'm like, yeah, I had never heard of them. I didn't know anybody that grew them. And so she sent them to me and I just scattered them out through this area and I've literally done, I don't do anything to them. And they just keep coming back and they've since multiplied um, and are kind of going throughout the flowers all the way down. So love those. They're a fun perennial to put in there. Now this is, you know, it's funny because I used to say this was our main vegetable garden and technically I think it's still the largest of square foot, but barely. So I still call it the main vegetable garden, but we've branched out and added so much more in that I'm not gonna be able to call it that very much longer, especially if we expand anymore. But this is my wood chip test pot. I have been adding in some compost and fertilizer to where I'm going to actually have rows. I have nothing in here except self-seeded dill at the moment. So I'm just gonna let the dill, we use a ton of dill. I love dill, it's also a great companion plant. Um, it attracts ladybugs. So if you have aphid problems, ladybugs are attracted to dill. So it'll bring in the ladybugs, which will then eat the aphids, which is a plus. Uh, because if you've ever heard like people will say, oh, if you have aphids, just go buy ladybugs and let them loose and they'll take care of the aphids. Well, if you don't have any plants that the ladybugs like, the ladybugs aren't going to stick around to even eat the aphids, so don't waste your money. So dill is a flower that the ladybugs like. So I've kind of let that just self seed in here. Um, I do have one lettuce that, I actually had a couple of lettuce that volunteered. I cut this back and harvested off of it and it's already growing back more leaves. So I'm kind of just letting it do its thing there, even though it's like in its own little island in its odd spot because it's still producing me lettuce. But I don't have anything planted in here yet because one, the soil needed to be amended. And two, I'm actually saving this for the fall garden, which will be planted in summer. What was interesting is last year, which I can't wait to show you because it's really cool. Last year, I planted our fall garden, gosh, I think it was the end of July. And 
I needed to do it earlier because a lot of the stuff like the broccoli and the cauliflower never got to be, it didn't form any heads before the cool weather hit and then it just didn't. Um, and so I have it marked on my calendar and that's one thing like your garden every single year you're going to learn for your area. And so I have it noted to self this year, I need to plant some of my fall crops about two weeks earlier than I did last year. And so that's what this area is reserved for because anything else that I try to plant in here um, is not gonna be ready to pull in most cases. I probably could get a little bit of um, French breakfast radishes. They're about 21 days. So I probably could do a planting of those and then pull them out in time to put my fall garden crops in. Anyways, so this is reserved for those fall crops that just don't do well throughout the summer and here because of bolting issues. But over here, um, this is where I have got my October beans. So we're actually doing more dried beans this year than I usually do, mainly because I have a lot of our green beans, the Tar Heel pole beans. Um, we didn't go through as many. I kind of canned. Last year was like the nobody knows what's happening because it's a pandemic. And so we're going to do way more food than we've ever done before. I don't, maybe it was just me. So I really canned a ton of green beans and we didn't go through them as fast as I thought we would. So I didn't plant as many this year, knowing I've got a good amount in reserve, which is something I always recommend. If you're in my academy, then you know that we, I preach that. Every year you need to be adjusting what you plant based upon what you actually need in your eating. So this year we're doing more of the October beans, which is a shelled bean. So I'm actually doing two trellises of that. Um, and then those are my little snow peas back here, which are coming along really good despite having these couple days of heat. Normally they're not too happy with that. So I need to make sure I water those tonight. Note to self. It's always a good idea to walk through the garden because um, there's lots of things if you're not out here very often that you will miss. So here I've got, I'm actually planting some of my pepper plants. I wanted to do more peppers this year and I ran out of room in the high tunnel. So I'm doing some of my pepper plants out here. The pepper plants aren't as susceptible to blight as tomatoes. So I'm okay with putting the peppers out here. Um, they're actually doing really well, even with having, like I said, some of those days where our high was only 56 degrees. I'm actually quite surprised at how well these guys are doing. So, so they're doing um, really good. In fact, oh, I've got a couple little blossoms already starting to form on them. So we'll see how these do throughout the, the rest of the summer, but I'm pretty hopeful that they're going to do well not being growing undercover or in a warmer environment like the high tunnel. This is all of our garlic. So... As you can see, it's going really well, nice and lush. Garlic's doing great. Um, it will probably be ready to harvest in about another six weeks or so. So it's still got a little bit of time. Now it's mainly doing a lot, finishing out its bulb formation. So that will be the garlic crop. And then when I pull that, I should be able to put in some more fall crops there as well. So I'll be able to, to rotate through that. And then over here, this little tunnel here, this is all of the um, Cherokee black beans. We grew those last year and really, really liked them. I was trying to make sure this year though that we had the beans a little bit more staggered because when you're seed saving, beans are self-pollinating. But with 22 years of seed saving with beans, if they are planted close together, you'll notice that it takes a couple of years, but you will begin to get a little bit of genetic drift. And so I have found that just by having a buffer of some space between varieties drastically reduces that to almost like nil. So Cherokee black beans are here. We didn't use quite as many of those as I did our October beans. So that's why I have two of them here. And then again, this is, oh, Melissa did not pick up her seed starting containers before we filmed. So note, note to self, I need to clean that up. Um, there's no plants under it, which is great though, because that's actually hot quite with the sun going through it. Um, but again, this is all lettuce that, so that's not always a bad thing when stuff bolts and goes to seed because it replants itself the following year, provided it's something you want to be planted and it comes up in willy nilly spots. So this is some lettuce that I had last year that just self seeded itself. It's almost ready to harvest. I'll wait until tonight because you don't ever want to really harvest your lettuce when it's hot out because it's wilty. Much crisper if you do it in the morning or in the evening. Um, same thing here. These are just lettuce that self seeded themselves. Um, I did plant more pickling cucumbers on that side of the trellis. Um, I did it that way because the beans are going to come up much higher. That's my northern exposure. The cucumbers won't get up quite as high, so they won't block as much. Um, so I tried to transition that, that I had the shorter crop on the southern exposure so it doesn't provide shade for things behind it, though I don't really care if it shades some of the lettuce. That will be harvested long before the cucumbers are up, though, and providing shade. 
This is what I wanted to share with you though, that I was very, very excited. So this is the one broccoli plant that I left in the ground that I actually planted last summer that never produced a head in the fall because it just didn't have quite enough time before the cool weather hit and the shorter days of daylight. So it got left in mainly, I guess I just forget to pull it. I don't know, life happened. You guys look at this. It's formed a head. Now, albeit it's a smaller head, but I have a broccoli head that is forming on this. And there's like little side shoots that are just beginning. So I was actually very impressed. And now I know that if something doesn't form a head in the fall and it makes it through the winter, which this one obviously did, not to pull it up because I will still get some type of production on it. Um, was really, really surprised to see that. I've never left them in the ground that long if they didn't produce a head. Uh, to know it would do that. So we'll see how big this head gets. Hopefully this weather doesn't throw it right into bolt, but I was pretty excited to see I'm actually gonna get a harvest on it like nine months later. So over here, I've got, um, these were carrots that were done last year. These were fall carrots and I left them in. Right now it's just getting ready to form the flowers and the blossoms, which will give me my carrot seed. Um, so I like to leave carrots in and I like to overwinter them about every two to three years so that I can refresh my seed. Um, so that's what these guys are doing. And ladybugs really love carrots, especially the blossoms. The carrot blossoms are beautiful, actually. They look gorgeous in the garden when they're all bloomed out. Um, but these are another great, great thing to put in there to attract your ladybugs. Here I have undercover still. So if you saw um, that video where I was growing undercover, I've got my cabbage is going great in here. And for the most part... It is keeping the bugs and the slugs off. In fact, look at this. I don't know if you can see, there's like a little trail of slime on the top here. I don't know if the camera can pick that up it's just as the sun hits it. That is where a slug crawled up top because it couldn't get down and actually into my plants. So it's definitely saving them. Um, Mr. Slug wasn't able to get any of them. He just had to crawl on top and look down at the buffet that he could not get to. So that makes me quite, quite happy. Um, over here, I've got my Brussels sprouts. So these won't be ready until fall and I actually need to plant some more. Um, I've got Brussels sprouts growing in here and then I've got a cabbage there and then I've got a bunch of lettuce. So this I will be, especially these bigger ones, um, I'll be harvesting all of that this week, just cutting them off so that they can regrow. And then I did reseed a little bit of lettuce, but I reseeded it like the day before it got super hot. So I might have to replant some of that lettuce. It might have been a little too hot for it to germinate. I'm not sure. And then last but not least, this is my first celery. I've never grown celery before. It's so funny the things that, you know, you garden for two over two decades on your own. I'd never grown celery before. So this is my first year growing celery, which I'm quite excited about and melon, I'm growing two new things this year, melon and celery. And then I also have uh, baby beets. So I've got beets through here. Um, this is where I did a little bit of fun kind of succession planting with the beets by the variety. So I have some varieties um, that are going to take like 85 days. And then I had others that were supposed to be a fast growing beet that would only take like uh, 55 to 60 days. So we'll see how that works out. My thought was I plant all the beets at once and then I'll have my harvest will be staggered without me having to plant beets every two to three weeks. But funny story, I planted the beets right before we left for Tennessee for the Homesteaders of America conference. And so it was not home in order to keep them watered or an eye on them. And only about half of them came up. I think it's because while we were gone, apparently we had like a weird heat wave like we are right now. And then boom, it went back to cool. But because I wasn't here, um, the, the soil wasn't able to keep wet which is what they need for their germination so i had to reseed my beets anyways so i kind of did manual succession planting of them without intentionally doing it but i'm kind of excited to see with the different varieties how many days it actually takes for them to harvest and if they stay true to that um, if i want to practice that again next year we are open right now starting today for enrollment to the Pioneering Today Academy. Only open a couple of times a year, but if you are looking for an online community that has everything that you need on self-sufficiency, including a tribe of people who understand what it is that you're going through and are there to support you, make sure that you click the link below because we're only open for a very short period of time.